In this video, we're going to go through Chapter 3, Taylor Series. So we're going to start by looking at some definitions and then um, talk about Taylor's Theorem. And to arrive at Taylor's Theorem, we're going to go through several other um, theorems, including the extreme, talking about extreme values of smooth functions, extreme value theorem, Rolle's Theorem, the mean value theorem, and then finally Taylor's Theorem. And then we'll go through some applications and examples. So first, let's talk about some definitions. As we go through uh, this section and, and later into the course as well, um, we're going to be using some notation uh, that derives, derived, or it comes from um, some the, the math courses that you probably have, have seen before. So you should review the mathematical preliminaries, or which is section one on the web notes, to uh, refresh your memory on some of this notation. So just a few of the kind of important ones. Um, R with the symbol is used to designate the set of real numbers. This symbol is uh, used to designate an element in the set. So for example, if A is a real number, then we can write A in R, or A is an element in the set of real numbers, or A is in R. When we write this f colon a arrow b indicates that f is a function that maps an element, for example, x is an element of a, to f of x, which is an element of b. So for example, if we write f goes from r to r, this indicates that f takes an element of r, which is a real number, and gives you another element in r, or another real number. So for example, if, if um, f is the function x squared, it takes um, a real number like 2 and gives you f of, of 2, which is 2 squared, which is 4. Again, another real number. So take a look at the mathematical preliminary section. You don't need to read all of it, but just familiarize yourselves with some of the um, important notation. So now with this notation, we can say if let f be a function from r to r, be a smooth differentiable function, Smooth means differentiable. And um, we have an, an element a, which is an element of r. Then the Taylor series of the function f of x around the point a is given by this expression. So f of x is equal to f of a plus the first derivative of a, or first derivative at evaluated at a times x minus a plus f double prime a over 2 factorial times x minus a squared, etc. And this is you see the um, dots here. This indicates that this is an infinite um, sum. So let's just write a couple of notes. So n factorial, um, or this n exclamation mark, is the factorial notation. So n factorial means n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, all the way down to 1. So 2 factorial is just 2 times 1. 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, etc. Now here we're using um, a as the base point, and we're writing it as um, this step size here, x minus a. In uh, the previous chapter, we called the base point x naught, and we said that x minus a was equal to x minus x naught, which we called h. And both of these are acceptable notations, um, and they're, they're used in different uh, sources. So here we're going to continue with using a. Now, a particular case of the Taylor series, um, when a is equal to 0, then the expansion is known as the Maclaurin series, and it's given by f of x is equal to f of 0 plus f prime 0 x plus f double prime 0 divided by 2 factorial times x squared, etc. So this is um, just to illustrate the Taylor uh, polynomial approximation for the function f of x is equal to sine of x plus 0 0.01 x squared um, using different numbers of terms in the approximation. So you can see each of these has a different number of terms. Now I've set this up as an interactive example on E-class, but here I'm just showing a few different um, cases. So the blue line is the exact function, and then the 
yellowish line is the uh, approximation with the varying number of terms. And so n, this double n up here, um, changes the number of terms. So when we have two terms, the constant plus something times x, um, we just get this linear function. And then here we get this um, quadratic function. Here we've got up to x cubed and then up to x fourth. And you can see that the um, base point here is, is 1, so the function is, um, or the approximation is exact at the base point, and then um, it's close near the base point, and then once you get farther away, it becomes, we get this bigger error. And so we can have a better approximation as we add um, more terms. So you can take a look at the example on, on E class. Um, and see what happens when you change the value of the number of terms that are added. So we can go through a kind of elementary or non-rigorous proof um, to show how we get this Taylor uh, approximation. So we, if we assume that a function can be written as a polynomial expansion around the point A, we can say that any function f of x is equal to this uh, can be written as a, a polynomial. So a0 plus a1 times x minus a plus a2 times x minus a squared plus a3 times x minus a cubed, um, etc. Then if we can evaluate the function and its derivatives at the point a, we can find the following. So the function at a is equal to um, this expression here. So I'm just plugging in x is equal to a. So you can see that all of these terms Go, are equal to zero, as along with all of the uh, higher order terms. So f of a is just equal to a zero. Now the first derivative of a is given. Um, the first derivative of x evaluated at a is given by this, and so you can see that we've the first term here is zero, and the second term is um, a one, and then all of the terms above that are going to be equal to zero. So we're just left with a one. Now the second derivative of f of x evaluated at, at a is equal to this, and so again we um, all of these terms from here and higher are equal to zero. So we're just left with two times one times a two, and we can continue. So now the third derivative of, of f at a is equal to this plus all of the terms above here are going to be equal to zero because of this a minus a. So what we're left with is 3 times 2 times 1 times a3. And this can continue on. So that means that um, f of a is equal to a0, f prime of a is equal to a1, f double prime of a is equal to 2 factorial a2, the third derivative of a is, is um, 3 factorial a3, etc. So that means that we can rewrite this as um, f of x is equal to f of a plus f prime a times x minus a plus f prime a divided by 2 factorial times x minus a squared, etc., which is the Taylor poly polynomial expansion. So where this term is a0, this is a1, a2, a3, etc., just based on um, the derivation that we showed. So this is the Taylor polynomial showing that how this can um, how we can arise arrive at this for a function. Okay, so we want to talk about Taylor's theorem, and first we need so first we want to talk about extreme values of smooth functions. So let's um, consider local maximum and local minimum. So if we have a function on a closed interval from a to b uh, that maps to R. Um, we have some function that looks like this. So this is our closed interval from a to b, and we have this function. And we want to talk about these maximum and minimum values, local maximum and local minimums. So f is said to have a local maximum at a point c in this interval from a to b if there exists an open interval i within a and b such that c is in i, so c is in the interval i, and for every x in this interval, f of x is less than f of c. So we can find some value c that's in this um, interval i, which is a subset of, which, of the interval a to b, and every value of x, for, for every value of x in this interval, f of x 
is less than or equal to C, means that C is a local maximum. Similarly, we can, as F is said to have a local minimum at a point C in this interval A to B if there exists an open interval I such that C is an element of I and for every X in I, F of X is greater than F of C. So again, we've got this point C, which is in some interval um, from A to B and every point, for every point X in this interval I f of x is greater than f of c, greater than or equal to f of c, then that means that c is a local minimum. And if f has either a local maximum or a local minimum at c, then f is said to have a local extremum at c. So we can make a preposition that says if f is a function on this uh, closed interval from a to b and it's smooth and differentiable. Now we want to assume that f has a local extremum, so either a maximum or a minimum, at a point c in the open interval from a to b, then the th derivative of f at the point c is equal to zero. So as an example, let's consider this function f from minus 3 to 3, where f is equal to x cubed minus 3x. So we have this function from the interval minus 3 to positive 3, and it's given by f of x is x cubed minus 3x. So the first derivative of f of x is equal to 3x squared minus 3. So f of x, the first derivative evaluated at 1 is equal to 0, and the first derivative evaluated at minus 1 is also equal to 0. So that means that um, f prime of 1 is equal to f prime of minus 1 is equal to 0. So these values here we can see that at the local minimum and local maximum the derivatives of the function are equal to zero. Now smoothness or differentiability is a very important requirement for this proposition to work. As an example consider this function shown below. So this function is continuous but it is not differentiable everywhere. It has a local minimum at x equals zero however f the derivative at x equals zero is not defined. So that means we cannot use the, this concept that the slope equals zero to find the minimum value. So proposition two says we have this function f on a to b is, and it's smooth and differentiable again. Um, and we assume that there exists a point c within the interval a and b such that the derivative of, or the first derivative at c is equal to zero. Then, if we look at the second derivative, so if f double prime of c is equal to zero, then f is a constant around c. If f double prime is greater than zero, then f of c is a local minimum. And if f double prime is less than zero, then f of c is a local maximum. So again, let's consider our function f goes from minus three to three, where f of x is equal to x cubed minus three x. So we've got our function here. We know the first derivative of f of x is equal to 3x squared minus 3. The second derivative is then equal to 6x. And we know that we have um, two extremums um, where f prime of 1 is equal to f prime of minus 1 is equal to 0. So we have two points in our interval where our slope is equal to 0. And now we want to look at the second derivative to see if their local minimums are local maximums. So um, the value of the point at f of 1 is equal to minus 2, and the value of the point at f of minus 1 is equal to positive 2. The second derivative of f of 1 is equal to positive 6, which is greater than 0, so that means it is a local minimum. The second derivative of f at um, minus 1 is equal to negative 6, which is less than 0, so that means it's a local maximum, which we can, of course, verify uh, graphically. So now um, we need to talk about the extreme value theorem. So the statement of the extreme value theorem says that let f be a function um, on the interval from a to b and it's continuous. Then we can say that f attains its maximum and its minimum value at some points c max and c min on this closed interval from a to b. 
So this simply states that if we have a continuous function on a closed interval, it will reach a maximum and a minimum value somewhere in that interval. So let's consider this function. Um, f goes from minus 1.5 to positive 1.5, where f of x is equal to x cubed minus 3x. So again, this is our same function. We just changed um, the interval here. So we can see that um, this theorem states that f has to attain a maximum value and a minimum value at a point within the interval. So it attains its maximum value and its minimum value within this interval. So f of minus 1 is equal to 2, and f of plus 1 is equal to minus 2, which is the maximum and the minimum, respectively. Alternatively, we can consider the function f goes from minus 3 to 3, where, again, we still have the same form for f, x cubed minus 3x. So now, um, our maximum and minimum are attained at the um, the ends of the interval. So that's why it's important that we um, that the statement contains that it's a, a closed interval because that means that the maximum and minimum could actually happen at the boundaries of the interval. So the maximum here is f of 3 is equal to 18 and the minimum is that f of minus 3 is equal to minus 18. So now let's talk about Rolle's theorem. So the statement of Rolle's theorem is that f is a function um, on the closed interval from a to b, and it's differentiable. We want to assume that the value of the function f at a is equal to the value of the function f at b. If that's the case, then there is at least one point c within the, inter within the open interval from a to b where the first derivative f prime of c is equal to zero. So the proof of Rolle's theorem comes from proposition one and the extreme value theorem. Basically, the extreme value theorem ensures that there is a local maximum or a local minimum within the interval, and then proposition 1 ensures that at this local extremum, the slope of the function is equal to 0. So let's consider the function f from 0 0.5 to 1.5, with f of x is equal to 12.5 minus 5x minus 30x squared plus 20x cubed. So on that interval, this is what the function looks like. So f of 0 0.5 is equal to f of 1.5, which are both equal to 5. So f of a is equal to f of b. So this means that at some point in this interval, there is a point where the slope is equal to 0, which occurs at this point c, which is within the interval from 0 to 0 0.5, and um, the slope is equal to um, 0. So in this case, um, f prime of 1 half plus 1 over the square root of 3 is equal to 0, and this value of 1 half plus 1 over the square root of 3 is contained within the interval, 0 0.5 to 1.5. Now the mean value theorem states that if we have a function f on a closed interval from a to b is, and it's differentiable, then there is at least one point c in, a, in the, inter, the open interval a to b such that f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So the proof comes from an application of Rolle's theorem and the theorem states that, it states that there is a, a point c inside the interval such that the slope of the function at c is equal to the average slope along the interval. So let's consider the function for minus 3 to 3 where f of x is equal to x cubed minus 3x. So we have this function here. Uh, the slope of this function is, or the first derivative of this function is um, f prime of x is equal to 3x squared minus 3. So the average slope is f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. So this line here, which is equal to, um, in this case, 6. So the theorem states that there are there's at least one point within this interval where the slope at that point is equal to the average slope. So in this case, there are two points, um, and x is equal to the square root of 3 and uh, minus the square root of 3, where the slope is equal to the average slope. So f prime of, my, of square root of 3 is equal to f prime of, the, of minus square root of 3, which is equal to uh, 6. So now all of these um, can lead us to the statement of Taylor's theorem. So Taylor's theorem states that if f is a function um, from r to r, and is n plus 1 times differentiable on an open interval i, and we have a value of a in the set of i, 
then for every x in i, there exists c between a and x such that uh, f of x is equal to f of a plus f prime of a x minus a plus f double prime of a over 2 factorial times x minus a squared, etc., up to plus um, fn, the nth derivative of a divided by n factorial, plus this um, remainder term, which is a function of this um, value c. So the, all of this is the, called the nth order Taylor polynomial, or pn of x, and this is called the remainder term. So if the function f and its derivatives are known at a point a, then the function at a point x away from a can be approximated by the value of the Taylor polynomial, or Taylor's approximation, which we call pn of x. So f of x is approximately equal to pn of x, which is um, this uh, finite number of terms, uh, n number of terms polynomial. And the error, or the difference between the approximation pn of x and the exact function f of x is given by, um, as we know, our definition of error, f, the exact value f of x minus the approximate value pn of x, which is given by this remainder term, which is, a, again, a function of c. And the upper bound on this error um, is the absolute value of e is less than or equal to um, this max of the nth derivative or n plus 1 derivative of c divided by n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the power of n plus 1. Now I won't go through um, a, a proof of this, uh, it's beyond the scope of this course, but we um, will use this upper bound of the error. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it can be used um, in a few examples. So basically what this says is that the function f of x is equal to the polynomial approximation, or pn of x, plus um, an error term that is order of h to the power of n plus 1. where h is equal to x minus a. So with the error o, o um, h n plus 1, as h gets smaller, then the error gets smaller in proportion to h to the power of n plus 1. So for example, if we choose h1 is equal to 0.1 and h2 is 0 0.05, then e1 over e2 is um, becomes 0.1 over 0 0.05 to the power of n plus 1, which is 2 to the power of n plus 1. So if the step size is halved, then the error is divided by 2 to the power of n plus 1. So if the function um, f on some closed interval c d between c and d is infinitely differentiable on an interval i, and if a is an element of i, then for every x in i, f of x is the limit of the sum of the Taylor series. So the error, which is the difference between the infinite sum and the approximation, is called the truncation error, as we saw previously. So we can approximate our function f of x using, um, well, this is the Taylor expansion, um, which is this infinite sum here. And we can say that instead the, the function is approximately equal to the nth um, order polynomial, where we, which is equal to this finite sum, where we changed basically the inf infinity sign to an n. So let's look at some applications and examples of, uh, in particular, of the Taylor series. So the following are the Maclaurin series, which is the Taylor series with a is equal to zero, for some basic infinitely differentiable functions. So e to the power x is equal to 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial, etc., which is written as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the power n over n factorial. Sine of x is given by this, um, so x minus x cubed over, over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial, etc., which can be written in um, the compact form of the with the sum here. And similarly, cos of x is equal to 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial, etc., um, which can be written in as this infinite sum here. So let's consider e to the power x, and we can see how this comes about by applying uh, the Taylor's uh, theorem. So we apply to the Taylor's theorem to uh, the function f of x is equal to e to the power x with a is equal to 0. 
So the first derivative of the function is also equal to e to the power x. So that means f prime of 0 is equal to e to the power 0, which is equal to 1. And this is equal to the second derivative as well as the third derivative, etc. All of the derivatives of e to the x are just equal to e to the x. So um, that means when we write down our Taylor uh, expansion here, um, f of x is equal to f of a, etc. Our f of a is 1, f prime of a is 1, f double prime of a is 1, f triple prime of a is 1. So all of those um, values uh, go to 1. And then a in all of these is equal to 0. So that's what we've chosen as our a. So that means what we're left with is f of x is equal to 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial, etc. Now Taylor's theorem is also um, used to come up with uh, in these ideas of numerical differentiation, which we'll talk a lot more about later in the course. Um, but for now, we can just see how Taylor's theorem provides um, is, is used to, to come up with some of these differentiation formulas. So Taylor's theorem provides a means for approximating the derivatives of a function. So the first order Taylor approximation of a function f is f of x is equal to f um, of a plus f prime of a times h plus this error term or order on order, which is on the order of h squared. So again, h is equal to x minus a is the step size. So we can rearrange this equation um, for the derivative. So we say that f prime of a is equal to f of x minus f of a divided by h plus oh squared over h. And we can divide this oh squared over h to say that um, our, our derivative is equal to f of x minus f of a over h plus oh. So um, the forward, this is, is, can be used to come up with the forward finite difference. So if we use the Taylor series approximation to estimate the value of the function f at a point xi plus 1, and we know the values of the point at xi, which is less than xi plus 1, then we have f of xi plus 1 is equal to f of xi plus f prime of xi h plus order h squared. So where h again is equal to xi plus 1 minus xi is the difference between these two points, um, or uh, the step size. So this gives us the forward finite difference approximation of f prime of xi. So we rearrange this expression um, as we did in the previous slide, and we can get the forward finite difference approximation is um, f prime of xi is equal to the value of the function at the next point, so at f um, of xi plus 1, minus the value of the function at the current point, divided by the difference between these two points. And the accuracy of this method is on the order of h. Similarly, we can uh, apply the same procedure to get the backward finite difference. So if we use Taylor series approximation to estimate the value of the function um, f at a point xi minus 1, knowing the values of the point xi, which is greater than xi minus 1, then we have f of xi minus 1 is equal to f of xi minus f prime xi h plus order h squared, where again h is equal to xi minus xi minus 1, so the difference between the two points. Um, and we rearrange this and we get the backward finite difference approximation for of f prime of xi. So basically we're saying that the derivative here is equal to um, or an approximation of the derivative is equal to uh, the value of the point here minus the value of the previous point divided by the distance between those two points, and the accuracy of this method is order h. We can also use um, similar ideas to come up with what we call the centered finite difference. So if the values of the function f are known at two points, um, xi minus 1 and xi plus 1, and the 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 difference between xi plus 1 and xi and xi plus 1 or xi minus uh, 1 and xi are both h, then we can use the Taylor series to approximate the derivatives as, um, as shown here. So we can write the Taylor series expansion about for these two points um, and they're both require up to um, this h squared term and then we've got the remainder term is order h cubed. Then we can subtract these and divide by h, and we get um, the centered finite difference, which says that the 
value of the derivative here can be approximated by taking the value of the function um, at one point ahead minus the value of the function at one point behind and then divide by 2h which is the distance between those two points and the accuracy of met this method is order h squared. The Taylor series can also be used for um, in the familiar process of building differential equations. So if we have this function that we want to be obtained using a differential equation, um, here we call it v, we can, if we know the value of, of um, v at a point x, v at some x plus delta x is, um, can be written is in terms of the Taylor series expansion. And we can see how this um, can be applied um, in what should be kind of a familiar process for building differential equations. So for example, if we have this beam and we want it, it has a density um, and it's under some constant um, force, horizontal force here, which we call B or B1, we want to find um, the value or the, uh, an equation that describes the stress S11 along this beam. So we want to find the distribution of S11 or sigma11 along the beam. So what do we normally do is we consider an element or a slice of the beam with a thickness dx and the cross-sectional area of this beam is a and then we draw um, a free body diagram of this. So we've got our body force um, rho b1 which and, and rho is uh, the density per unit volume, so we have to multiply by the volume, which is the cross-sectional area A, multiplied by the, um, the thickness of this, which is dx, gives the volume of the element. We've also got our stress, sigma 1, 1, and um, the stress on the other side is sigma 1, 1 plus partial sigma 1, 1 by partial x, dx. But really, this actually contains all of these other terms because this is really just the um, Taylor expansion of, of our function sigma, which is a function of x. And we can call this, all these extra terms, we can call order dx squared. And then we apply balance of forces in the horizontal direction. So um, in this case, if, assuming that it's not accelerating anywhere, the sum of f is equal to zero. So we've got minus sigma 1, 1 times the area A gives us the force plus sigma 1, 1 plus partial sigma 1, 1 by partial x dx plus ordered dx squared all times A uh, plus our body force rho B1 A dx is equal to zero. So again, we have this same expression and we're just going to expand and simplify. Um, so this is expanding everything out, multiplying um, this term here by the A so we can see that we've got two, these two sigma 1, 1 a's cancel out. We can also um, then cancel out the dx a in all of the rest of the terms. And what we're left with is partial sigma 1, 1 by partial x plus rho b1 plus um, order dx squared. And then what we do is um, take the limit as dx goes to zero. And this gives us our differential equation that describes the distribution of the stress as a function of x within this beam. Taylor's theorem can also be used to approximate continuous functions. So it essentially discusses approximating differentiable functions by using polynomials. So the approximation can be as close as needed by adding more polynomial terms or by ensuring that the step size h, which is x minus a, is small enough. And it's important to realize that polynomial, polynomial approximations are valid for continuous functions that are not necessarily differentiable at every point. So, um, for example, if we have a function f defined on an inter from, interval from a to b, then the stone weierstrass theorem states that for any small number epsilon, great, which is greater than zero, there exists a polynomial p of x such that um, the maximum difference between f and p is less than or equal to epsilon. So in other words, we can always find a polynomial function that approximates any continuous function on the interval from a to b with any degree of accuracy sought. So this is extremely important in engineering applications. Essentially, it allows us to model any continuous function using polynomials. 
So if we wish to find the distribution of a variable, so like stress or strain or velocity or density or etc., um, as a function of position, and if this variable is continuous, then we can assume a Taylor approximation for the unknown function. Now the function has to be continuous, but it does not need to be differentiable, um, which is, is, is really um, important. So basically we can have this function that's continuous, not necessarily differential, but everywhere. And we can always find a value of, of, for any value of epsilon, we can always find a polynomial approximation that has an error that is less than or equal to epsilon. So let's see a couple of examples of um, applying the Taylor's theorem. So we want to apply the Taylor's theorem to a function defined from uh, 0 to inf positive infinity, where f of x is equal to the square root of x. And we want to estimate the value of f of 5. So we want basically to find the square root of 5. And we're going to use the value of the function um, a at 4. We also want to estimate an upper bound for the error. So let's write a couple notes. First, the square root of 4 is very easy to calculate. So that makes um, 4 a good choice to use um, for our approximation, as well that it, it is reasonably close to 5. All derivatives of f are easy to compute since they contain the square root of 4. The function is increasing. And the true value is given by the square root of 5, which is 2.23607. So this is what the function looks like, and we want to find the square root of 5. We want to find this value of the function here. And we want to do that by the Taylor approximation about the point a equals 4. So the Taylor approximation of the function f of x around a point a equals 4 is given as follows. We should be familiar with this expansion by now. So f of x is equal to f of 4 plus f prime of 4 times x minus 4, etc. Now, if n plus 1 terms are used, including um, the, this first term, the f of 4, then the upper bound for the error is given by this expression. The derivatives of f of x can be calculated um, as is shown here. So our function of x is the square root of x. So we can calculate all of its derivatives and evaluate those at f of 4, um, which, and the values are shown here. So if two terms are used, um, so a first order approximation, then um, f of x, or f of 5, is approximately equal to f of 4 plus f prime of 4 times 5 minus 4, which is equal to 2 plus 1 over 4, or 2.25. The upper bound on the error is then given by this expression, and here where we've got, um, so the interval, a is equal to 4, x is equal to 5, and um, n plus 1 is 2. So then we get um, this form of the upper bound of the error here. But now the question is, what value of c do we use? We have to choose some value of c in this um, closed interval from 4 to 5, but what value do we use? Well, we choose the one that gives the maximum value for, um, that basically maximizes this expression. So in this case, it's the one that gives the maximum value for f prime, or f double prime of z. So if we plot this f double prime of x, we can see um, that the, the value that maximizes this is when z is equal to 4. So f double prime of, of 4 is 1 over 32, so we can plug this into our uh, expression for the upper bound of the error. And we see that the upper bound of the error is 0 0.015625. So this means that the error is going to be less than or equal to um, 0 0.015625. And we can calculate the actual error, which is, um, so we take the absolute value of the error is um, the exact value minus the approximation, which is 0 0.0139, which indeed is less than the upper bound that we calculated. Now, if three terms are used, then this becomes our expression for our, our approximation for f of 5, which is 2.23438. The upper bound on the error, again, is given by the same expression, but here we've got um, our n plus 1 is now 3. 
And again, um, we're going to use C equals four to maximize this. So um, the upper bound of our error is 0 0.001953. And indeed, our error is less than that. So if we take the exact value minus our approximation, we get 0 0.00169, which is less than 0 0.001953. And this shows, um, the, the upper graph here shows approximations to our function with different orders. So um, the exact line is plotted as well as the first order, second order, and third order approximations on this interval from um, three to five. And you can see at four, they are um, exact because that's our value of a and at five which is the where we're, we were interested in you can see the difference in the approximations and this the lower graph here is plotting the true error so um the exact value minus the approximation for those three different approximations first second and third order so, um we can consider another example. So we apply Taylor's theorem to the function defined between negative infinity and one, which is the square root of one minus x. And we want to estimate the value of f of 0.1 and f of negative two using a is equal to zero. And we also want to estimate an upper bound for the error. So again, we can write our notes. X um, at x is equal to zero. The function is the square root of one, which is easy to calculate. All derivatives of f at x equal to zero are easy to compute since they contain the square root of one. The function is decreasing, uh, and the true values are given by the square root of 0 0.9 is 0 0.948683, and the square root of three is 1.73205. So this is what the function looks like, and we want to approximate the value at 0 0.1, as well as negative two. And we're going to use um, a is equal to zero for our base point. So the Taylor approximation for the function around um, with a equals zero is given here with n plus one terms, um, including the f of zero. And if a is greater than zero, or sorry, if, if x is greater than a, then the upper bound for the error is given by this. And if x is less than a, then the upper bound for the error is given by this. But the only difference here is um, that this is x minus a and this is a minus x. So the derivatives of f of x can be calculated as shown here. And we can evaluate these all at f of zero, um, or at, at the point e x equals zero, as shown here. So for x equals uh, point 0.1, using two terms, our approximation is um, 0.95. And using three terms, we get um, this estimate here, so 0 0.94875, using four terms, another estimate, um, and you can see that we're getting closer to the exact solution. So we can look at the upper bound of the error using four terms. So this was our four terms. The upper bound of the error was given by this expression, um, which we can uh, simplify and get as this function of C, and we got it. We have to figure out now what value of C do we want to use? Well, we want to use the one that maximizes this, which would be at um, 0 0.1. So we can choose any value between 0 and 0 0.1. We want to choose the value that maximizes um, this to provide us with the upper bound of the error. So that occurs when C is 0.1. So that means the upper bound of the error is 5.64822 times 10 to the minus 6. And if we t take um, our approximation here and um, find the actual error, so this was the exact value minus the approximation, we get 4.2 times 10 to the minus six, which indeed is less than our upper bound of our error. Now for x equals minus two, using two terms, we get um, that the approximation is equal to two. Using three terms, our approximation is 1.5. Using four terms, our approximation is again equal to two. Using five terms, our approximation is 1.375. Using six terms, our approximation is equal to 2.25. So you can see that the, the Taylor series um, for this function around x around a equals zero, it does not give a very good approximation, but it it's actually keeps oscillating. So if we look at the number of terms and the value of the function, we can see that 
um, it, it is oscillating and it just starts to get a little bit out of control. It starts to grow. So with 20 terms, it's 11, um, 1183.36. And then with 21 terms, it's negative 2187. And if you look at the error, you can see that it begins to oscillate uh, wildly. And the reason for this is because we're trying to approximate the value um, at negative two by using the base point over here at zero, which um, is too far away in this case for it to converge. And so we're not getting a very good approximation. So we can note that the t of the series always converges for um, functions like sine of x, cos of x, and e to the power of x. But for other functions, like the one in this example, it's best when x minus a is as small as possible. There are analytical techniques to find the radius of convergence of the series, but they're beyond the scope of this course. Okay, let's look at another example. Um, we want to use the zero through the fourth order Taylor series expansions to approximate the value of the function f on r to r defined as um, this polynomial here. So f of x is equal to minus 0.1x to the fourth minus 0.15x cubed minus 0.5x squared minus 0.25x plus 1.2. And we want to um, find the value of this function at x equals one using a base point of a is equal to zero. Now it's important to note that the error reduces to zero when using the fourth order Taylor series approximation. And that is because the fourth order Taylor series approximation of a fourth order polynomial function is identical to the function itself. So you can think of this as, as follows. So the zeroth order approximation provides a constant function, while the first order approximation is provides a linear function. The second order Taylor series approximation provides a parabolic function, and the third order provides a cubic function. And the nth order Taylor series approximation of a polynomial of degree n is identical to the function of being approximated. Um, so I solved this, um, this problem in uh, MATLAB and I will post the code for um, this as well as the, the previous examples on eClass so you can take a look. And uh, the web notes have a, a description um, going through with the different um, Taylor approximations. For now we can see um, a graph of the result. So these are the, the zero through fourth order approximations of this function uh, with the base point of x is equal to, or a is equal to zero. And so you can see that the exact is given, um, shown by the, the circles, and you can see that the exact follows exactly along the fourth order um, green curve there. So that is um, the end of the Taylor series chapter. So the Taylor series um, is, is very important in, in numerical analysis and you will encounter it um, in the rest of this course as well as in, in any other um, future courses that you might take in ad more advanced methods in numerical analysis. It's a very powerful theorem and a very um, important one, uh, especially in these topics.